The delusion, the delusion of Brexit forces its proponents into ever smaller circles and ever deeper holes. It is as though our leaders have already cut themselves off from the leaders of the European Union and the rest of the world. The government now plans to borrow a hundred million pounds to fund what in effect will be a propaganda war. It will do no, it will do far more to undermine public confidence than to create that confidence. It will stretch the loyalty and independence of our civil service perhaps to breaking point as they define the line between truth and party propaganda. Instead of making judgments based on facts, expert opinion and sound advice, the government retreats deeper into the caves of its own prejudice where they hear only their own voices or voices like theirs echoing back across them. In their world, it is all a great adventure. In this world, their world, the poor Europeans need us more than we need them. In their world, we only have to wave the club of no Brexit to Johnny Foreigner and he'll come running back to heel. Well, I say tonight, welcome to the real world, a parliament opposed to no deal, public opinion opposed to no deal, the European Union opposed to ripping up the withdrawal agreement, the new government clinging to power by a gossamer thin majority, the ranks of backbenchers behind the new Prime Minister filled with those that he has sacked because they, like every thinking right-thinking MP and citizen of this country oppose no deal. The simplistic assertions of the new Prime Minister melt in the face of cold logic. There is no majority for no deal. There is no democratic mandate for no deal. There is no way that Boris Johnson can force his extreme Brexit on the British people without our permission. <clears throat> and just read today's headlines. Boris Johnson can't even sell his views to Ruth Davidson, the leader of the Scottish Conservatives, let alone to Nicola Sturgeon, who commands a substantial majority in the Scottish Parliament. Today, he got another cold shoulder in Wales and a bucket full of cold water from the Irish Prime Minister. Of course, faced with these setbacks, <laughs> there has to be someone to blame. I read on the news as I drove here tonight that Mr. Johnson has said that no deal will be Europe's fault. Prime Minister, the Europeans did not ask us to leave. They didn't bribe the British people with the promise of £350 million a week for the health service. They didn't promise a wholly illusionary golden future outside the European Union. Prime Minister, as you so eloquently expressed it just last week, the buck stops there, on your shoulders, mountain deep. Our former partners, Europe's leaders, will of course have read of Britain's glorious freedoms to create new trade. They will know how successful the minister responsible for negotiating all those promised deals was. <laughs> so successful that the Prime Minister's first act was to sack him. <laughs> and our European colleagues, their leaders, 
they will wink knowingly at each other as they read the enthusiasm portrayed in some British newspapers for a special relationship deal masterminded by that great international philanthropist, Donald Trump. <laughs> but in the meantime, their colleagues will be on the phone to the motor manufacturers, Vauxhall, Nissan, Honda, and to their supply chains here in the manufacturing base of England, the Midlands, offering generous relocation deals. And some other of their colleagues will be on Eurostar to the City of London, expounding the virtues of Paris, Frankfurt, Milan. Well, I suppose we have to accept every possibility. Perhaps the Prime Minister's gamble is right. In his words, the Europe's leaders will be on the phone, pleading for another chance, begging forgiveness for the way they treated Theresa May. <laughs> well, Prime Minister, I would only say to you, I wouldn't put a pound on it. <laughs> However little is left of that pound at the end of this game of Blind Blind Bluff. I do not stand before you tonight to claim that we have won the war against the folly of Brexit. What I do say is that with every passing day, our chance of winning get better. There may yet be a general election, a general election where the bogey of Jeremy Corbyn will be wheeled out in the traditional Reds under the beds campaign. Redder beds, bigger beds. This will be the last throw of a campaign that has run out of any credible arguments for its own case. All the polling evidence supports the view that a Corbyn victory is simply incredible. In the meantime, the finest lawyers in the land and the bravest politicians in the House of Commons are working within the law and the procedures of Parliament to protect our national interest. Millions of our fellow citizens drawn from every corner of these islands, from every political party, from every part of our society, share the convictions that have brought you here to Birmingham tonight. We will not be bullied. We will not be bribed. We reject the divisiveness, the bitterness which Brexit has divided our country. Britain was never just an offshore island outside Europe. We believe as British citizens, as British patriots, that we are stronger, more prosperous, more powerful as a partner in Europe. That is the rock of our national self-interest. That is where we stand tonight, tomorrow, with pride.